My name is Pancratios Papacosta. I'm a professor of science at Columbia College, Chicago. I'd like to introduce to you a documentary that we have made recently about Henrietta Leavitt. She was an astronomer at Harvard College Observatory, and in 1908, she made a monumental discovery that not many people know about. But that discovery, it was the key to understanding the universe. It was a hundred years ago that Henrietta Leavitt, who was a worker at the observatory, uh, made the first published mention of a very important relationship from photographic plates that she had measured, what has turned out to be a very important kind of variable star called Cepheids after the prototype star, Delta Cephei, which is one of the bright stars in the constellation Cepheus. And these are stars which pulsate, which get bigger and smaller in a very regular way. And she was the first one to realize that the period with which the stars pulsate was related to how bright they are. Periods are very easy to measure. All you have to do is get up every night and you take a look and you, you see over the course of about a week that they get brighter and dimmer. Distances to stars are very difficult to get. And so her relationship allowed us to determine distances to these stars. So they became what we call a standard candle. We could now uh, take them and run. Edward Pickering was a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He developed some of the first standard physics laboratories. And so he was not an astronomer, and it was a very interesting and inventive pick on the part of the Harvard Corporation uh, to bring him here. The observatory was uh, going strong, but its forte was delivering time. Time for the railroads, time for the sea captains. It was somewhat languishing in terms of astronomical research, despite having uh, such a major telescope here. Pickering was interested in mass-producing astronomical data. His brother was rather interested in photography, so Pickering enlisted his brother to help get a photographic program started here. Pickering himself was interested in collecting data on huge numbers of stars. He was interested in developing photometers so that it was possible to measure the brightness of stars uh, by uh, partially mechanical means that gave uh, not only unprecedented accuracy, but accuracy in bulk, so that he was working not with dozens of stars or hundreds of stars or thousands of stars, but tens of thousands of stars. And similarly, uh, when the photography came, he got the idea of putting a prism at the front end of the telescope so that every star on his photographic plate would show its spectrum. And that way he could mass produce the spectra of stars. And that's then why he began uh, putting women to work at the observatory. Many were genuinely interested in astronomy, but it was considered unfit for nice young ladies to be up all night long at a telescope. But with the photographic plates that could be brought indoors, uh, then it was possible for them to work essentially on a daytime job that was still tightly linked with astronomy. So that Pickering essentially became the first CEO of an astronomy factory, uh, getting lots of people working under his supervision to help produce these masses of data that he was looking for. These women were called computers because there was a lot of arithmetic uh, involved. For example, you're going to make a catalog of stellar spectra. You've got to know precisely where each of those stars is in order to identify it, which means measurements on the photographic plates and then converting those 
measurements in inches or millimeters into uh, the sky coordinates. So there's a lot of computation involved and hence they were called computers. Here we see clearly a second class uh, labor force being employed which as I said was not unusual in those days, uh, it was everywhere uh, basically the same. Women were much better than men in doing this job because first they had more patience than men looking at a piece of glass for hours. And second, they had keen eyesight. Maria Mitchell, uh, one of the early American astronomers, who said that we women, just the way we do excellent embroidery in a minute way, we are also using the same eyesight to dissect the star and actually derive its qualities. Brilliant type of analogy, embroidery and, and, and computing stellar uh, characteristics. It was not uncommon for women who were interested in science to go to work as human computers, as I've heard it said, in doing computation at the uh, observatory. And there were several Radcliffe students who worked there as students and then went on to full-time uh, work. I understand they were paid 25 cents an hour um, and that it was fairly arduous kind of daily routine of concentration and uh, rigorous thought um, for which they did not get much recognition. Welcome to the plate stacks of the Harvard College Observatory. We have here a collection of astronomical photographs and it covers a hundred year time span starting in about 1885 and ending in about 1989. These are um, dry plate negatives so that it is a reverse of what you would see in the sky. The stars are black and the background would be light and it's an emulsion spread across glass. Uh, glass is a very stable substance as opposed to paper or film which would wrinkle over time and would give you inaccurate measurements. So the collection was used to watch change over time change in brightness, change in position, and whether things reappear and disappear, things like asteroids and comets. Um, we have about 520,000 plates. I'm still in the process of counting. Last time I counted, we were at 419,000, but I have half a floor still yet to count. So we have both the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere represented, which is unlike any other collection in the world. And that's very important because you need the full sky coverage in order to study stars. And uh, we also have the oldest collection in the world in terms of a large collection of photographs. 1885 was very early in the astrophotography. Uh, we have toward us the emulsion side, which is the gelatin that was spread across the glass. This is all factory produced and not exposed until it was put behind the telescope. And uh, then on the other side would be a, a much, you probably can't tell unless you get very close, but it's a shinier appearance. That's the glass side. And anybody studying a plate would place it like this toward them so that the glass is facing them and then they can actually touch and write on this surface. You see the end of that fly spanker there? That's definitely a galaxy. can almost see that it's a spiral. But what I want you to try to understand is how, how amazingly complicated this work would be to get down with your eye and to look at things that are a lot less obvious than that. So their visual acuity must have been very, very high. And I think that they're, uh, they were quite tolerant of repetitive tasks in fact, the director who began hiring women hired them because he really believed that women could take on repetitive tasks better than men could, that they were um, more tolerant of that kind of work. Henrietta Leavitt is known for two different things. One is a catalog of sequences of magnitudes of stars near the North Celestial Pole, but her most important discovery was about Cepheid variables. and. The result of that still informs astronomy today and is a foundational piece of data for pretty much all astronomical work done uh, even to the present. So what she did was to look at a kind of star called a Cepheid variable. A Cepheid variable is a large star 
that uh, has a relatively short lifetime, so they're not altogether that common. But she was able to find uh, a couple of dozen of them in two of our near astronomical neighbors, the small and large Magellanic clouds. Now they can be seen only in the southern hemisphere. So even though she couldn't see them from her uh, position at Harvard, there were uh, photographs taken from a southern observatory in Peru. And she found over 2,000 variable stars. And for two dozen of them, she found a really important correlation. And the pattern that she found was this, that the connection between the absolute brightness of the star is connected to the period of their variability. Now, it's hard to know exactly how far those stars are away, but there's a little trick. Because all of these stars were in the same neighborhood, they were in the same small Magellanic Cloud or the large Magellanic Cloud, they are all at the same relative distance. So, she knew that they are all roughly the same distance from Earth, and so she could find this pattern. Now, the idea here is to use these Cepheid variables as a standard candle. So the idea is this. Suppose you would make uh, a 50 candle um, batch, and they're all exactly the same. Now, if you move these candles at different distances, even though they give off the same amount of light, the farther away ones would be a little bit dimmer. And you can actually measure how much light comes to you from these candles, and you can determine exactly the distance to these candles by how much light comes to your eye from these candles. So you can do the same thing with these Cepheid variables. And Henrietta Leavitt's contribution is connecting that period of variability to the magnitude of these stars, these standard candles called Cepheid variables. This discovery is of such importance that you couldn't do astronomy today without that discovery. So, two really important results came within a couple of decades. Edwin Hubble, first of all in the late 1920s, discovered that there were these Cepheid variables in uh, a galaxy called Andromeda, M31, and he could compute the distance then to Andromeda. And he realized this is many times more distant than the farthest objects in the Milky Way. This answered a question that had been vexing astronomers for a couple of hundred years. Is the Milky Way the only galaxy in the universe, or are there many galaxies like the Milky Way? And he discovered through Henrietta Leavitt's discovery, in fact, Andromeda is a different galaxy, and there are many galaxies throughout the universe. But he also discovered, with these Cepheid variables, that the farther away these galaxies are, the faster they're moving away from us. And this was the evidence that our universe is actually expanding. So these two uh, results now uh, are well known and connected to Hubble, but without Henrietta Leavitt, no way could he have made this discovery. So Henrietta Leavitt really should get some of the credit for this. Uh, I think the situation for Henrietta Leavitt is probably the same as it is for our students today. That is, Oberlin and other liberal arts colleges don't train students for specific jobs or specific fields. They give them a more general education, a very firm grounding in um, the, the literature, uh, the philosophy, the ways of thinking. And, and rigorous training and problem solving in science courses and things like that so that their mind has been prepared to do almost anything they're faced with later in life. In Henrietta's case, probably the foundational studies at Oberlin certainly gave her the background required and the creativity and the, the, the ability to notice things and, and um, make judgments and generalizations that she did later. Uh, all of that follows from a solid classical liberal education. Henrietta Leavitt uh, studied languages here. She studied both ancient and modern languages, Greek, Latin, French, Italian, German. She studied English. She took philosophy classes, natural history, and mathematics. And then in her final year, she studied astronomy. She returned after she graduated for another year to study uh, astronomy further with Professor Pickering, who ran the Harvard Observatory. Our uh, knowledge of Henrietta Leavitt is very slim. 
There is not any correspondence. We do not have a diary. Uh, she obviously made this tremendous contribution and yet left very little um, in way of documentation of her experience. Unfortunately, that's the story of far too many women. And too frequently, women made these tremendous contributions and it's still not known that they have done so. The documentation is picked up by men who get credit for those um, discoveries or innovations and the women get very little notice. I read a book, Miss Levitt's Stars, and I made the analogy that if you made a triangle of the modern astronomical world as we know it today, and you brought it to an apex, on the apex, at that apex, on the shoulders of Henrietta Levitt, would be the foundation on which that triangle was built because she provided the basis by which it could be done.